With this week's drive, we stay in front by the narrowest of margins. Watch some changing fortunes in Holland. Charge through the field in Germany. And get a different perspective in Spain. All this and more in this week's competition-packed drive. The Formula One season has suddenly taken a whole new twist, with Williams drivers Ralf Schumacher and Juan Pablo Montoya scoring back-to-back -back wins in Germany and France. Ralf's world champion brother Michael and his Ferrari were eclipsed, but now the teams head to the fast and flat Silverstone. The track has seen many changes since the first British Grand Prix over half a century ago. Every time that the FIA or the drivers have asked for a change, it has been implemented. But the changes haven't always worked out right. It often turns out that the level of knowledge only really improves after accidents, that you can only really learn in this sense from accidents. There are some things that you just can't simulate. In trying to maintain his winning streak, Ralph has driven many laps of Silverstone in the team's simulator. It's an extremely fast track used by various teams for testing. The track offers passing opportunities in both fast and slow corners. The cars will reach nearly 300 kilometers an hour and drivers will endure more than 3G at some point. In 15 years, Ferrari has only won there three times, William six and McLaren five times. I particularly like the fast corners and the fast combinations at Silverstone. Immediately after the start-finish straight, there's an incredibly fast right-hand corner and then an S-bend, which you take in fifth or sixth gear. It's a real challenge. It's not easy to find the right balance for the car here, and it's hard for the driver to go right to the limit. But if you are on the limit, it certainly gives you a huge thrill. Given that Silverstone is in England, with that country's infamous weather, there's a good chance that the race will run partially or completely in the rain. This would obviously put a whole new complexion on the race and may favour low-ranking Jordan, whose factory is across the road and who knows the track intimately. Silverstone is renowned for the fact that it sometimes rains a great deal. In the rain, the whole field gets mixed up very nicely. So my tip is, if we have true Silverstone weather, then one of the three top teams, Williams, Ferrari or McLaren, will win here. With back-to-back -back wins at the Nürburgring and Manicur, Ralph is clearly the man of the moment and is intent on hauling in his illustrious brother. With two 1-2 finishes on the trot, Williams are hounding Ferrari for top spot. Things might look very different when the teams pack up to leave Silverstone. But Ralph's biggest threat will surely be from his teammate Juan Pablo Montoya. He's got the same equipment and a big point to prove. The sunny Norris Ring hosted the fifth round of the 10-round DTM championship, with 128,000 spectators lining the track. Jean Alessi was quickest off the grid in his AMG Mercedes. Too quick, in fact. Two laps on, the ex-Formula One driver was forced to observe a drive-through penalty for his jump start, which effectively ended his chances of victory in the race. As a result, championship leader Bernd Schneider had a one-second lead over Christian Albus before the first pit stops. But a major fumble with one of the rear wheels meant that Schneider remained agonizingly stationary for much too long, and it was all that Christian Albers needed to claim a commanding lead. Schneider dropped to fifth, and although he made short work of reigning champion Laurent Aiello's Audi, he found Peter Dumbreck's Opel a tougher nut to crack. In fact, Schneider benefited from the unlikely help of Peter Terting. The Audi rookie blatantly held up Dumbreck after his second stop and Schneider was able to get out of the pits and rejoin in front of the Scotsman to steal away third place, which he maintained to the end. Malbus took the flag with Marcel Fassler in second place, making an all-AMG Mercedes podium. Dumbreck scored his fifth consecutive point-scoring finish of the year in fourth place, while a fight back from Jean Alessi took him up to fifth. Albers now moves a point ahead of Schneider in the overall standings. 
JJ Leto started behind the wheel of the champion racing team's Audi R8 in the American Le Mans Series Grand Prix of Atlanta, second of 10 rounds. The Finnish ex-Formula One driver moved into an early lead after passing James Weaver's Dyson's Racing Lola MG on the sixth lap. The car then led for all but one of the remaining 77 laps of the race on the 2.54-mile road Atlanta circuit. Leto's teammate Johnny Herbert, a three-times Formula One race winner, had finished second for the team on numerous occasions over the last two years. But he went one better this time as the pair finished the race in front in a time of two hours and 45 minutes. Frank Bieler and Marco Werner finished in second place in another Audi R8, 30.4 seconds off the pace. The Fellows and O'Connell Corvette C5 had to limp slowly back to the pits with a blown tyre that put them down the order, eventually finishing ninth overall and third in class behind another C5 and a Ferrari 550. The Sasha Marson and Lucas Lur Porsche was having a torrid time in the pits and on the track, but at least they were able to keep going. The Lola MG of John Field and Duncan Dayton finished in third place overall, but won the LMP 675 class for smaller prototypes. Colin, Shep and Floyd had less luck, hopelessly beaching their Porsche. Danica Patrick, making her debut in the series, finished in fourth place with co-driver Jerome Pollockand in a Ferrari. The Porsche 911 GT3 RS of Jörg Bergmeister and Timo Bernhard won the GT class, beating teammates Marsen and Lure by 6.7 seconds. The next round is at the end of July at Sonoma in California. In fact, Sonoma was also the scene of the most recent NASCAR round, the only other road course that NASCAR uses is at Watkins Glen. Early on, points leader Matt Kenseth lost his left rear tire on lap 36 of the 110-lap race. He was running ninth at the time, but the incident dropped him to 24th. With 53 laps left, Kyle Petty maneuvered back onto the track after a spin right in front of Jack Sprague, who slammed on the brakes and was promptly rammed by Steve Park. Petty got away to finish 27th, and Sprague ran out of fuel 10 laps later, but Park's race was over. And more to it, right? With 45 laps remaining, three cars spun out in unison as they ran side by side into a corner. This synchronized spinning caused chaos, but the race carried on and miraculously everyone got going again. Like I said, big and ugly. Synchronized spinning. No caution, no caution. Race leader Robbie Gordon looked dead set for disaster with this concrete barrier just five laps from the end. But luckily it was just styrofoam. Don't do that anymore. Can't make it. From then on, Gordon held off Jeff Gordon to win the race, his first victory in 52 races. He led for 81 of the 110 laps in the Sonoma race, including the final 31. His only top five finish last year was third on the other road course at Watkins Glen. Perhaps there's a message in there somewhere for him. 1983, Riverside, California with Ricky Rudd. Right here with Dale Earnhardt in 95. With that self same Paul Tracy looking. This was the view from a small camera mounted inside Paul Tracy's helmet as the Canadian started a cart race from pole position for the second time this season. The race got underway at the fourth attempt. Officials decided that the cars had not lined up properly for the first three tries. Tracy, running second, pitted on the 44th lap, but lit up his tires to beat race leader Adrian Fernandez out of the pits to grab first place. Just Jordan got sideways. His crew were ecstatic and congratulated each other on the fast stop. You betcha. Two laps later, Tracy tangled with Michel Jordan, whose car suffered some damage and ended up facing the wrong way on the track. Then Tracy was slapped with a five-second penalty after officials decided that he had exited the pit lane illegally earlier on. On lap 73, Tracy served out his five-second penalty in conjunction with the regular pit stop, but miraculously, he got back out with his lead intact. Thirteen laps later, Adrian Fernandez made a daring move and passed Tracy to take the lead. Going for P1, Adrian Fernandez takes over the lead, but Paul Tracy will try to counter, and he cannot. Two laps after that, Rodolfo Levine went down the inside of Max Pappas, 
and then veered left into him, putting them both off the road. Gets into Mad Max. And now he is going to give them but it will be a glorious day for Fernandez, who won the Portland 200 just as rain began to fall. It was the eighth win of his career, but his first as a team owner, and his first since winning at Surface Paradise in Australia in the year 2000. The victory moved him to fifth in the points race. Tracy finished second, but moved into the lead in the championship. Final qualifying for the MotoGP race at Assen attracted sportsmen not usually seen at motorcycle races. Tennis player Richard Krajacek and soccer star Clarence Siedorf. Two weeks earlier, Loris Caparossi made history by scoring Ducati's maiden MotoGP victory in Barcelona in the Italian manufacturer's first championship season. And in bright sunshine at the famous Assen circuit on the Friday, Caparossi showed he was very much in the groove. In final qualifying for Saturday's race, the Italian set the fastest lap to claim pole position. Max Biaggi, riding a Camel Honda, would start the race in second place after clocking a best lap time just 0.171 of a second behind his fellow Italian. World champion Valentino Rossi had to be content with third on the grid after finishing 0.194 seconds down on Caparossi, despite having grabbed provisional pole position the day before. The Italian trio were the only riders to lap in under two minutes. I think uh, for us we have to do very hard working, you know, especially we improve a lot the bike from yesterday. And for sure my bike working good here, but it's not perfect. You know, the lap time of today for sure is very good. Uh, but anyway, I try to do good job also for the distant race, you know. I try many different times, but I think I have the good choice for tomorrow. We hope uh, we don't tell the rain tomorrow and uh, we, we cross the finger for this. And I think in Ducati is already for go fast also yeah, in Holland. Manuel Poggiali of San Marino went from strength to strength in the final session for the 250cc class, continually improving his lap times to consolidate his provisional pole position with a new circuit record ahead of Randy Deponay, Tony Elias and Fonzi Nieto. Spaniard Danny Pedrosa slashed almost two seconds off his provisional qualifying time to take pole position for the 125 race before crashing and destroying his Honda at the end of the session. The teenager threw caution to the wind after struggling through various breakdowns on Thursday, smashing his own previous pole record by almost a second after just six laps before sliding off and road testing his leathers. But Caparossi's crossed fingers didn't help and race day saw heavy rain. Valentino Rossi got away quickest, only for Spaniard Sete Gibbonau to stream into the lead past Rossi and his compatriot Max Biaggi. The best action of the race was during these opening few laps, as Gibbonau and Biaggi traded the lead twice, once after Gibbonau suffered a huge slide on the fourth lap as he was coming out of a turn, almost causing him to crash. But he recovered, and after retaking the lead on the fifth lap, he held the veteran Biaggi off for several laps before slowly widening the gap. Gibbonau is keen to disprove the myth that he's a wet weather specialist, but seemed masterful in the appalling conditions. He certainly wasn't complaining as he took his third victory of the year, 10 seconds clear of Biaggi in second, with Rossi a further three seconds behind. Capi Rossi placed sixth, 42 seconds off the pace, and behind the Yamahas of Carlos Checa and Olivier Jacques. The win was the 300th victory for Michelin tyres in the Premier Motorcycle class. Looks like Thursday I was physically here, but mentally not. I maybe was still in vacation with, with the boat, and, and I didn't do too good on Thursday. So uh, it's been really Friday and Saturday that we've picked up the pace. The win sees the Spaniard close to within 38 points of Rossi, but just eight points clear of consistent points getter Biaggi. The 250cc race was run in the same conditions. Australian Anthony West, riding in Aprilia, took the lead early on, passing four riders on the first lap and expertly handling the wet conditions to claim his first career victory. His win, two and a half seconds ahead of Franco Bertani of Italy and ten seconds ahead of Sylvain Gontoli of France, lifted West to sixth in the championship. 
Manuel Poggiali leads the standings by 15 points from Roberto Rolfo after they came home fourth and sixth respectively, with the next three breathing down each other's necks. In the 125cc race, German Steve Jenkner claimed his first Grand Prix win and Aprilia's 150th. The German was chased by Casey Stoner until the Australian had a bizarre crash on the third lap. The bike flipped over and hit me and the foot peg broke my helmet. The casing of the helmet cracked and sliced about two centimetres into my ear, so I have a few stitches, he said. Spaniards Pablo Nieto and Hector Barbera finished second and third, 10 and 14 seconds adrift respectively. Jenkner is in second place in the championship, behind Spanish prodigy Daniel Pedrosa, who finished eighth. Lucio Cecinello could manage only 16th in Holland. St. Julia de Lorio in Andorra hosted the fifth round of the World Trials Championship. The crowd came to see the talents of Montessa HRC riders Takahisa Fujinami and multiple world champion Dougie Lamkin, Adam Rager of Gas Gas and Mark Frischer of HRC Montessa as the geniuses of balance battled the local conditions in what turned out to be a low-scoring event. The course was a mixture of dry, dusty sections initially, with later rocky hazards in and around the fast-flowing river. At the highest point on the course, the riders were 1,350 meters above sea level, the altitude causing problems with a single-cylinder two-stroke machines. Fujinami wrote himself into the sport's record books when, after winning the last round on home soil at Motegi in Japan, he became the first rider in seven years to deprive the legendary Lamkin of top spot at the top of the championship. He would finish in a tie with Lamkin and Frischer for first place on eight penalty points, but would drop down to third place having cleaned two less sections, that is, finished them without penalties. Lamkin arrived in Andorra under immense pressure, having not won an event since the opening round in Ireland and suffering an inconsistent patch that had allowed Fujinami to knock him off the top of the standings. Wins in the recent Spanish championship had gone a long way to restoring the usual Lamkin confidence, and the British riders said he felt he had regained his form. And although a win continues to elude him, Dougie took second place behind the Spaniard Frischer, but this was enough to open a five-point gap over Fujinami and regain the lead in the championship standings in the process. On Saturday, Frischer came fifth, but on Sunday, despite amendments to five sections to add severity to the course and prevent another low-scoring trial, Frischer rode faultlessly, completing every single section without penalty points to keep his total at just eight. Although he tied with Lampkin and Fujinami for first place, he took the win, his third of the season, by dint of a faster overall time, Frischer taking 13 minutes less than the Englishman. Around 13,000 Austrian fans turned up to witness a virtuoso performance from the Belgian Stefan Everts. After escaping a pile-up near the start of the race, Everts battled it out for supremacy with his fellow Belgian Steve Ramon. After taking the lead on the second lap, Everts never allowed his KTM rival a glimmer of opportunity and won by a relatively comfortable margin of more than two seconds. Yamaha's Andrea Bartolini of Italy was third. Then the most successful motocrosser in the history of the sport added another chapter in his glittering career by storming to a double triumph. Ramon leads Bartolini with De Roiver and Maschio right behind and with Everts into the top six. Everts was gunning for more glory in the motocross GP event, but this time the Yamaha rider seemingly had to be content with second place as France's Michael Pichon led the way for the first five laps. Joel Smetz's hope of a fifth consecutive podium came undone on the opening lap and he finished fifth, while at the front, Everts and Pichon traded the lead. But with the exception of a comical do-it-by-yourself crash for Frenchman Antoine Mio, all eyes were on the tussle at the top of the field. With neither rider really able to establish control, the lead changed time and time again as both men rode at the ragged edge. With all the other riders seemingly in a different race, the battle for the lead raged on, but Everts made a crucial move on lap 12, nudging Pichon wide and over the edge of the berm. To the anxiety of his Suzuki team, 27-year-old Pichon lost a couple of seconds getting back on track. The Frenchman charged back to draw level again, but couldn't prevent Everts taking the flag by 0.35 of a second. Afterwards, the mutual respect between them was obvious. 
and I made a very aggressive pass where he made a small mistake and you know I, I gained some seconds on him and uh, I said now is the time to to go uh, full and that he you know he have to go to give extra and to uh, yeah to to be finally tired for the for the end and he uh, I must admit he made a very strong race both riders have now won three races this season Pichon still leads the championship standings by eight points with the seventh round of the World Championship Series set for Udavala in Sweden in two weeks' time. 24,000 fans packed into Copenhagen for the first ever Danish Speedway Grand Prix, fourth leg of the 2003 series. But it turned out to be a painful night for local star Ronnie Pedersen. In heat 12, the Danish rider slid off and hit the barriers hard on the first corner. He was bundled off to the hospital, but Ronnie, not to be confused with Nicky and John A. Pedersen, was expected to be fit for the next round in two weeks' time. Nicky Pedersen, who won the British Grand Prix in Cardiff a fortnight before and lay second in the overall standings, made it through to the final. It turned out to be a huge anti-climax for the fans as far as their home favourite was concerned, however. Pedersen's false start saw him disqualified from the race. The three remaining riders were current championship leader and five times world champ Tony Rickardson of Sweden, the USA's Greg Hancock and Australian Jason Crump. Crump accelerated clear to take a virtually unassailable lead from the first corner. Behind him, Hancock and Rickardson scrapped for second place. The Swede managed to edge past his rival on the second lap and held on to second place for the remainder of the race. Victory for Crump then, his first of the season and making him the fourth different winner of this year's series. The result sees the Australian leap up to third in the standings. With 61 points, he trails second place Nicky Pedersen by eight points. Two days later, Pedersen was sacked by his British team and promptly moved to another team, joining former world champion Mark Loram. Chasing his sixth championship title, Rickardson leads with 76 points. The next event is the Slovenian Grand Prix in Crisco. Probably the most important bullring in the world, Las Ventas in the heart of Madrid, has seen many acts of daring and bravery over the years. For almost 70 years, matadors battled bulls here, but one Friday night, the performers were of a very different kind. The second leg of Freestyle Crossfighters series had a capacity 23,000 crowd and eight of the world's best freestyle riders. Nate Adams performed an extended Superman and then put in a backflip, a maneuver not seen in Spain until Adams completed the stunt in Valencia a week before. Mike Jones, however, didn't have enough speed and had to abort at the top of the jump. He landed heavily, but the winner of the event two years ago managed to walk off. Having matched Adams's backflip in Valencia, Kenny Bartram managed to take his feet off the rests this time, and there was little doubt among the judges that they had just seen the winning rider. Bartram took the title ahead of Adams, clearly pleased with his second victory in eight days. Uh, just, it's awesome, an awesome feeling to win the Red Bull X-Fighters, especially two weekends in a row. Um, everybody here rode really good, and so I'm just stoked to uh, put my KTM on top. It's said that you're not a matador until you've conquered Las Ventas. Perhaps Kenny has joined the elite club. So whether you like your action flat out, sideways or rubbing on the ground, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.